Hi, good evening, doctor. Good evening, Dr. Alka. How are you? I'm fine. So today we are very happy to have Dr. Smita Avasti with us and she is a BCBAD. She's a doctorate in behavior analysis and she has vast 36 years long experience in this field of behavior analysis. We're extremely delighted to have you with us, Dr. Smita, today. I mean, you have been doing a great work in this field. I know that Dr. Smita has been working on capacity building, skilling the therapist, parental training, advocacy, education, and mentoring the students in the field of behavior, uh, behavior intervention, autism in particular, and all the latest things you're putting into action. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation this afternoon. We are very, very delighted to have you with us. During the COVID pandemic, she transitioned services online for the families with the children with autism and other special needs such as IDD and CP. She has the largest team of skilled professionals who provide direct on-camera services and also the parent training in India and the neighboring countries. I'm very delighted to have you with us, ma'am, this evening. She wears many hats, has many first, many, many credits to her. In 2004, she became the first board certified behavior analyst from India and the region. And she has provided leadership of behavior analysis by forming ABA India, a non-government organization and an affiliated chapter of ABA International, of which she is a past president. She provided leadership in organizing five conferences, advocated and presented to the government of India on the need of recognition of applied behavior analysis and hosted the ABA international delegation of government recognition. Thank you so much. She has published many journals, many her research papers are published in national and international journals. And she is recipient of many, many awards. In 2010, she founded her first organization, which is Behavior Momentum India, to provide one-to-one -one behavior intervention to children and adults with autism. Today, BMI, Behavior Momentum India, is the largest intervention center outside US with a team of behavior analysts RBTs and 200 plus paraprofessionals. It has nine centers serving nearly 300 plus people with autism and IDD between the age of 1.4 to 32 years of age. I know Dr. Smita personally, and I know you're doing a tremendous work in the field. And I'm sure that our viewers are going to be lucky to listening to you and your suggestions and opinion and how can we help children in this field. Thank you so much for accepting our request this evening to help all our viewers. Thank you so, so much. To start with, let me ask you a very simple and direct question that applied behavior analysis intervention is limited only to young children with autism or is it something vaster than this? First of all, thank you so much for the very detailed uh, introduction and uh, um, thank you so much for saying so many nice things. I, I don't even know whether I deserve them. Oh, I just you, do my you job really and, it. Thank you and so I much. enjoy what I do and I think that's, uh, that's the important thing for me. So you are uh, beginning this conversation with a very, very important con uh, question over here. And that is about, is it limited to young children or can it be used across older children with uh, autism and developmental disabilities also? So the answer to that is that uh, it's not just me who's saying that, but there is a huge body of research in applied behavior analysis, which, which has demonstrated that Behavior analysis principles can be used across any age, any gender, any disability, 
any uh, uh, no disability okay so anybody uh, uh, who is a human or an animal or who's moving and who does something applied behavior analysis principles can be used across anybody to both in increase behaviors and to decrease behaviors so when we want to teach a skill to somebody we can go across the spectrum towards any age and modify the behavior to teach them new skills so it's not limited to young children and uh, maybe it is possible that many people just young, work with the younger uh, population and so they uh, say that or believe that but we have been very fortunate we have children who have grown with us and we have grown with them and so we have learned to work with older children and uh, that's how you know we are right now working with at least one 32 year old and quite a few children who are above the age of 20 certainly i agree to you dr smita that early intervention is the best and that is why probably a lot of people think that it is just to be with the younger children better late than never intervention at any time is going to be a support for any human being now when we talk in terms of challenging behavior could you define for our viewers some of the areas where it has done miraculous uh, you know results and lovely intervention programs right so challenging behaviors what are challenging behaviors challenging behaviors will vary from uh, the the arena where that behavior is being demonstrated now if a child is a uh, uh, engaging in self injurious behavior if a child is uh, uh, hitting other people or hurting other people that may be one kind of challenging behavior however if a child doesn't behave appropriately uh, when he goes outside in a public arena with his family that is another type of challenging behavior uh being in a school setup and not following the rules of the classroom not listening to the teacher not doing what you're expected to do is another form of challenging behavior so we have to first de define what is a challenging behavior anything so, which is not suitable for that particular environment if that is defined as a challenging behavior then we can surely work on a variety of challenging behaviors so within the research Uh, uh of applied behavior analysis there are uh, uh, uh there are reductions in behaviors which are related to self stim behavior like for example hand flapping or maybe vocalizing inappropriately or uh, hitting other people uh, destroying property uh not engaging in appropriate behaviors in classroom uh, outings where children are grabbing things and you know not uh, uh, behaving appropriately in a social setup all these have uh, tremendous uh, research and work which has gone in the field and it is all documented wonderful thank you so much dr smita for actually spelling it out for our parents and the community which is going to be listening to it because people have a very different view about aba and it is so vast that it is beyond imagination and you've been doing this great work for 36 long years i really want you to share with us your experience especially using therapy and intervention following applied behavior analysis okay so uh, i think uh, let me start with uh, my one of my very initial uh, kids i started working with now this was a 6 year old girl uh, she had long beautiful goldilocks hair and she had no skills so she would not respond when you asked her do she would not uh, sit down and point at objects or pictures she did not identify anything she did not have any speech so it was a very uh, uh, difficult uh, child who came to me in those very initial years and uh, using the behavior analysis principles of positive reinforcement just simple positive reinforcement and differential reinforcement 
we managed to teach the child to sit down uh, to to stop shaking her body stop shaking her hair from this side to that side uh, look at objects point at objects Objects, identify objects, walk across in the room and identify things and uh, a little bit of communication. And I'm talking about this was 1993, 1994, long time back. At that time, I had just started studying about, about applied behavior analysis. Uh, gradually, as I started studying more and more and more, the time that we are taking to teach during the intervention is reducing. So what used to take maybe about six months to eight months to teach, we are now able to teach within a week. If I, if I have a child who comes without eye contact, then I can work in a couple of sessions and in, increase the eye contact, just a couple of sessions. And that is what the, uh, the science teaches us. That is what the science has taught us that you use the applied behavior analysis principles in, in such a way that, you know, you can see results quickly. So we can't say that, you know, it's like uh, something where you just go on forever. You just use the principles appropriately, correctly, under guidance, sometimes under guidance. So I have professionals across the world and I run to them for guidance all the time. And I say, this is where the problem is. This is what I'm doing and I'm not moving ahead. I'm obviously doing something wrong. So what is it that I need to change? What is it that I need to modify? And then, you know, you have strategies, you have better understanding of how the principles are being used. And then if you use those principles correctly, you see the change. Very right. So I think my experience people. has been really good. Yes. I uh, with all ages of children. Whether... And I, you are my teacher. Thank Actually, you so... uh, for all the viewers, I have learned uh, behavior analysis with Dr. Smita. And I, I really am very, very proud of being associated with you. And I see that you're very, very passionate about the whole thing. And I believe when you follow the principles with your utmost passion, the results are so quick, as you're saying, in a couple of sessions, a child who's not giving you an eye contact start to do that. I'm talking about especially how ABA can help the children, you know, who are non-vocal, totally non-verbal. How do we go about it? What should we be doing if you can guide our parent and the community of professionals for working with these kids? So thank you for asking that question because that has been my uh, area of PhD and it has been one of the last co uh, uh, largest cohorts of uh, students uh, where uh, I have worked with children who are completely non-vocal. So we worked with uh, children with a diagnosis of autism between the ages of one year, five months to the age of 12, 13 and, 13 and a half years. And these were the children who were coming to us and we started with the intervention where they were completely non-vocal. And we used certain strategies, communication strategies based completely on applied behavior analysis principles. And we could bring about the change where they not only started to communicate using signs uh, uh, with uh, people in the community, but also started vocalizing. So there is there, there is a large percentage of, uh, percentage of children, especially in my research, it was 83% of children who actually came up with vocals. Now the vocals were not words for everybody. So there were children, uh, I think about 50, 60% of the children had words, but there was certain percentage of children who had phonemic level speech. So they were not using complete words, but they had some speech which was evoked and then we started shaping them and then worked on them to make it whatever best uh, clarity we could bring in that. So when we have children who are without a, any speech, without any vocal, then of course, speech therapist is the most experienced person over there. However, within our field, even ABA uh, specialists, behavior analysts, they also work with children for evoking the vocals and Wonderful, developing the lovely, So uh, it's just that things may not happen very quickly. 
for some children it may happen faster than the others and some other children may take much longer but between young children and older children we generally give up on the older children we did not we kept on working with them and the 13 and a half year old child came up with vocals the uh, 12.2 year old girl she came up with vocals and somebody else one of my uh, colleagues bcba she applied the same principles on a 19 year old and she gave me feedback that he has vocals today wow wonder so, wonderful so non vocal I... children can can emerge with so actually we always say that you know a therapist with a hope to so keep working and never give up because certainly they can start to speak but a lot many times you know parents or therapists start to believe that if the child is of a certain age we know now it is very challenging to develop any kind of vocals thank you so much for talking about this area so when planning the intervention based on the science of aba what should be the area of focus dr smita we talk about how to plan the intervention or what should be the area of focus uh it's a very broad question that you're asking so no specific answer can be given over here because it would completely depend on the population that we are working with so if we are working with uh, Uh, somebody because i want to talk not just about disability but just to have everybody aware that if if we are working with people in the office and uh, uh, the team members uh, engage in uh, maybe checking the mobile very often and we want to reduce their off task behavior and increase the on task behavior then the intervention that we plan would be something else now if we are working with a child who has recently been diagnosed or who has a lot of behavior problem okay then the first thing we will work on is cooperation okay a child who's well settled and who is not able to communicate i think communication is another area that we really focus on so when we're talking about children with special needs and autism the starting point should all, always be cooperation and communication now cooperation with young children can also come as rule governed behavior which means that you uh, uh, teach the child and you ask the child to follow your instructions so this is the teacher this is the student i am asking you to sit down and do this so please sit down and do this two days the child will cry the third day the child will settle down now that is not generally how aba um behavior you know so uh, people who have studied behavior analysis work what they will do is they will start with positive pairing procedures where they are developing positive reinforcement contingencies okay and these positive contingencies pause the, so the child learns that if i listen to them something good happens to me if i listen and follow that small little instruction that they are giving me i i'm going to get what i want and that is a good starting point for the children so cooperation with special needs children and communication i think goes in a go, goes a long way because uh, a cooperative child will learn much faster isn't it the Very child right. learn at his potential level so uh, most of the time i see that uh, intervention plans do omit cooperation and this straight away plunge into teaching and when we plunge into teaching then we are half the time uh, you know uh, struggling so the therapists are struggling because they are not getting a cooperative cooperative child out there so yes. very nicely so, said but, dr smita i also had an experience of a similar type i remember in a school where i was heading and a teacher came up with this young girl who was only 6 years old and she said she's been the most notorious girl uh in the class and she she's been distracting the whole class and genuinely what you said work and the only statement i said first have a cooperative child so do some pre session pairing of something what she liked and believe it it worked like miracles so statement up here for all the therapists who are listening to dr smita it's a wonderful advice so instead of you know straight off jumping into what you're trying to teach first prepare a child and if it is a cooperative child always the learning is better thank you so much about this
Thanks, Tans, for sharing with our audience. Uh, coming to the intervention, the ABA intervention, can we use ABA intervention for teaching academics, toilet training, self-help skills, or settling down in a school? And what would be your piece of advice to our educators? So uh, what I would suggest here is that uh, we have some very nice uh, assessment tools have been developed and uh, uh, they, uh, when we are looking at a child with special needs, we uh, look at the child, but actually we look at all the various domain areas, starting from how the child is behaving with other people, whether the child is responding to other people, going to uh, his listening skills, going to uh, uh, labeling and understanding language around, you know, whatever we are talking, uh, then uh, looking at uh, uh, more deeper knowledge about talking about things when those things are not present. Um, we look at uh, uh, imitation skills, we look at visual skills, visual performance skills, we look at uh, uh, self-help skills. We look at academic skills. So reading, writing, math will come there and socialization and group behavior. So it's not something that I have developed. There are some, some really brilliant people out there in, in the field who have developed these tools and these tools can be accessed and one can easily learn how to do a comprehensive assessment of the child. And once the comprehensive assessment is done, which covers all the domain areas, then we decide what is the priority for the child depending on his age. Now, we all know, and coming from the Indian community, we know very well how much pressure is there to teach academics. And uh, many times, most people mistakenly believe that if we send a child to school, then the child is going to just learn everything and we don't need to do any extra therapy or teaching and all of that. And this is where sometimes uh, 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 there is an, uh, an error of judgment, I would say, because if by reading we could learn everything, then uh, every, everybody who goes to school would benefit. When we look at the autism spectrum disorder, what happens in a classroom is extremely complicated because the teacher talks in multiple words, multiple sentences, very complex instructions are given, very complex language is used. And every child who comes into the classroom is at a different level. So the child would be completely lost. And that preparation or priming needs to be done separately where the weak areas have to be worked and the child has to be primed to go to school so that he is understanding what's happening in the classroom. So ABA interventions do not focus on one thing alone. They fo focus on the overall development of the child. So we start with the basics and then gradually keep Rightly said, doctor, that assessment is very, very important. And at the onset, if the assessment is done, then certainly it gives you the directionality in which direction one should be moving forward. And I've seen that ABA is a very, very scientific process. And it is very, very useful process because anybody who's a student of ABA uh, would be using all kinds of tools and techniques and methodologies which one has learned upon. We might, this uh, videos may be viewed by some educators, some therapists, and of course, the parental community at large. So would you like to have some direct advice to them that how and what would you suggest them to help the children in need? So uh, I think uh, in this field, when we are working with children with autism and special needs, the collaboration between the parents and the uh, professional is a must. We cannot be working in a lacuna because we believe 
uh, in something and parents are possibly expecting something else. So the first thing over here is that we do an assessment, we try to understand the child and then we share our understanding with the parents. So we sit together and we say, okay, this is what I understand about your child from the assessment that was done. Tell me if I have understood your child correctly. And then the parent will affirm or say that, no, you're missing out a lot of things over here. So maybe we need to do a, another assessment or maybe somewhere we have to see how to get on the same page. Once we are on the same page, from there we start understanding what are the expectations of the parent. Because first we go through the assessment and we come on the same page. Then we look at parental expectations. Then we guide them that these are the things that need to be worked on first before we go to the next level and the meeting the expectations. So as a professional, I think it is important for us to take that role of guiding honestly and being able to also explain why we are making that recommendation. So if I'm saying that we need to work on these basic skills first, before we go to academics, then I should be able to explain why. And that is where the parent will be on board with you so that both can work together. Certainly, it doesn't work. Carry on. It doesn't work like as a professional, I am always telling guiding the parents, or the parent is guiding the professional. It's it is a uh, it is a task and a, a job where both have to come together and collaborate and work together. We have seen the best success where we work together as a team. Certainly, Dr. Smita, I totally endorse it. But um, I have come across a couple of parents, and I think. Uh, young staff come across and they mention it where the parent is in a total denial. And I would certainly would want you to address that issue because I have seen, especially in the Indian community, where the grandparents are around, they would come up, no, no, you know, ma'am, when his father was young, he was also like this. He started to speak very late and see he's so successful today. Or we didn't do anything. It happened by by itself or you know there are some kinds of notion where there is a total denial so what an experienced therapist uh, can see uh, the parents uh, fail to see that how to resolve that i think one of the issues around denial comes from giving a label okay and as a professional as a therapist as a consultant who's not a diagnostician I think it is better not to go into the label, but talk about what is bothering them. So if they have reached out to a professional because they were definitely bothered about something. So if they're bothered that the child is not giving eye contact or the child is not listening to instructions, then I think we need to work on them rather than saying that this is the child's label. And so we need to, you know, first admit and accept that. I think it's not important to go by that. It's, it's more about working on the symptoms. And especially when it comes to autism spectrum disorder, if you work on the symptoms and the child can overcome those symptoms. So that kind of eases the situation. Of course, accepting a child with difficulties within a home environment is not easy. It's not easy for anybody. So sitting on a high chair and giving that kind of a advice may sometimes not be very, you know, it may not be accepted at all. So everybody goes through a certain cycle of acceptance. And I think we need to give them that time. Certainly. Sometimes right. as a professional, it makes, breaks the heart when you see that you can do so much and the parent is not ready. And they're like, no, 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 leave everything and go to school. And then the same child comes back after five years. It breaks your heart. Because you know that you could have helped at that point in time. But then I think that's something that we all have to leave it uh, to the parent. Because they are the people who have to decide what's good for their child. Certainly. Correctly said. Dr. Smita, thank you so much for enlightening this, this total group of people who would be listening to this recording. Rightly said, assessment is very important. Denial may happen instead of getting into the process of labeling, which can be heartbreaking for parents. It is better to focus on the need of the parents. So if the parent is coming to you because the child is not talking or child is not giving eye contact 
or not able to follow instruction or whatever it is, if we focus on that, I think it becomes easier to break the ice between the parent and a therapist. And a very, very good advice by Dr. Smita is today that anything will work when everybody, all the stakeholders are on the same page. When you start, when the teacher in the class, when the parents are around, when the therapist, everybody understands it. Pre-session pairing was something fantastic. So cooperative child will always give you better results. So please bring in that by doing something with the child, what he loves doing it. I think you've really touched on some very, very salient and important features of applied behavior analysis. And that can be seen with your vast expertise and deep 36 years long experience in the field. We are really delighted that you've given your precious time to our community. We look forward to this association in future. Thank you so much, Dr. Smitha. It's indeed a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Alka. Keep on doing the good work that you are doing. I have known you for many years while I was in Dubai. So keep up the good work and let's continue to do what we are doing. Learning from our children, isn't it? Yes. Thank yes. you. So we, the learners, always keep doing some great work together. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot. Thank Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.